Greetings, online scholars, and welcome to our Tom Schatz New Hollywood Lecture. So, uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, the New Hollywood article that I've assigned, uh, and this is, of course, by T Tom Schatz, who is uh, a scholar who's interested in what we call political economy. And so, political economy, and for the people who, who study political economy, political economy. What's, what's important is, uh, in essence, power, uh, but how power is uh, manifest through money. So people who study the political economy of the media, for example, are very interested in things like who owns what media organizations, what influence might this ownership have over the kinds of uh, cultural products that are produced by these media organizations. And so Tom Schatz is a, is a big name in, in this field. And, and this article that he wrote has to do with uh, what we call New Hollywood. And he's, he's using the phrase here a little differently than you might have seen it in the past. Uh, often when we talk about New Hollywood, we're talking specifically about the Hollywood of the late 60s and early 1970s. Uh, Schatz is, is talking about uh, New Hollywood in, in terms of what, uh, you know, at least in film 2700, you learned about as, as the blockbuster era. So uh, for Schatz, then, the blockbuster era, which begins with uh, Jaws and, and uh, you know, is sort of cemented into place as the new mode of Hollywood filmmaking by movies like Star Wars and uh, Superman in, in 1978. Um, he's, he's interested in this period, and he's looking specifically at, at the way that the, the financial model of Hollywood changed and how this change impacted the kinds of movies that they were making, and, and thus the kind of movies that inform popular culture, since, after all, this is media and popular culture. So, so the, the blockbuster era begins in, in the mid-1970s, and, and Schatz specifically argues that, that this 1970s advent of the blockbuster was a kind of restabilization of Hollywood. And Hollywood was in uh, what he would call a disarray for, for about three decades, right? It, it was having a hard time sort of dealing with the challenges presented by, uh, well, there were, there were a whole bunch of challenges that came after World War II. Uh, you know, people were, were moving from the city to the suburbs. Uh, you know, the, the place of movie theaters, the, in other words, the little geographic space of, of movie theaters changed from uh, downtown business districts to, to things like drive-ins and suburban movie theaters. Uh, of course, television presented a whole host of challenges for uh, Hollywood filmmakers because they weren't sure how to deal with these free moving image boxes that were in people's homes. And the, at the same time, the country's demographic was changing, right? You'll remember that when folks came back from World War II, uh, you know, they had money in their hip, the economy was humming along, and, and people were having a lot of babies. And, and so what happens is that by the mid-1960s, early 1970s, this baby boomer generation had come of age and, and represented the largest demographic in the country. And so Hollywood, uh, you know, had to change the way they made movies in some sense to cater to this new crowd. Uh, so, you know, again, there was a lot of uncertainty and disarray. Uh, and, of course, because he's interested in what we call political economy, uh, Schatz focuses on the economic, technological, and industrial context in which this whole uh, trend of blockbuster movies that continues today uh, in, in which this developed, okay? So, 1946, again, as you might remember from film 2700, was the biggest year ever for the Hollywood box office. They had revenues of over $1.5 and weekly ticket sales uh, between roughly 90 to $100 million. I've heard the number as, as high as 110 So what this means is that you had an enormous amount, well over half of the U.S. population, going to the movies every week, Right? Um, today that number might be 20 percent. Uh, so, so this this clearly represents sort of the the acme or the zenith, the high point uh, of Hollywood movie making. Uh, and you know, prior to this time, we had seen some films that sort of served as as prototypes or as models for what would eventually become the blockbuster film. He specifically mentions uh, the films Duel in the Sun and Gone with the Wind. 
Uh, and he says, you know, these were these were prototypical blockbusters. These were the these were the movies that sort of laid the groundwork for what would become the blockbuster film. And and he makes a case, right? He says they 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 were based on a pop. Each one was based on a popular novel, so it's got sort of a built-in fan base. Uh, both featured top stars. Both had big budgets. Had really big kind of sprawling narratives, sprawling stories. Uh, had strong production values. And, and they also gambled uh, in terms of marketing on a nationwide promotion and release campaign. So meaning that they, you know, uh, it wasn't uncommon uh, before these movies for them to be released in different cities at different times. Uh, but, but these had nationwide releases with, with a lot of marketing power behind them and a lot of advertising. So Shad says, listen, even before the blockbuster era of the 70s, we had models for what would become the blockbuster film and, and it helped us kind of understand, you know, this is how you make a really big film that has the potential to make a lot of money. Of course, on the flip side of this, they have big potential to fail as well. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So he sort of traces the history of what's happening in Hollywood beginning in the 1940s. So, you know, he begins with 46, which is the best year for Hollywood. And then he moves through uh, different events. So the next thing he talks about is the Paramount Decree in 1948. Now, you remember this is where the, the Justice Department came to an agreement with the Hollywood studios, the major film studios, uh, and after a long court battle where, they had, uh, where the Justice Department had accused the Hollywood studios of um, oligarchical business practices, right? So uh, uh, they were running an oligopoly in essence, right, which is kind of like a monopoly, but with, with several players. And so as a result of the Paramount Decree, right, the studios had to, had to sort of change up the way they did things. So one of the accusations the Justice Department had made against the Hollywood studios had to do with their uh, business model of vertical integration, where they controlled every aspect of the American film industry from the top down. In other words, they controlled the production, uh, circulation, or, or right, uh, yeah, circulation and exhibition of the American film industry, right? So they they controlled every aspect of it. They made the movies, they distributed the movies, and they showed the movies in their theaters. So as a result of this decree, the studios agreed to to get rid of their theater chains, right? And as a result, they didn't have a guaranteed outlet for their product. Now, if you go back and you watch a lot of the movies from the 1940s, you'll see that uh, many of them are not of top quality, to say the least, right? Uh, and there was a reason for this, and that's because they understood that they needed sort of filler content. And you see the same sort of thing on Netflix today, by the way, where there's a bunch of content that's arguably not very good, but serves as kind of a filler, right? And, and helps fill out their catalog. And this, of course, is what the studios were doing prior to the Paramount Decrees. They were making some really good movies, but they were also making a lot of B movies, a lot of movies that were not of top quality, that they fed to their theater chains. So they had an outlet. They had the exhibition outlet, and they needed to keep them stocked up on movies. So they made these kind of lame movies and, and put them out, and of course, they, they engaged in what was called block booking, uh, which means that if you, know, if you were an independent theater owner and you wanted to get their big movies, you also had to take the bad movies. So uh, what happens, again, with the Paramount Decree is that as soon as the studios divest themselves of, the, of their chains, their theater chains, they have no outlet for their, for their products, right? Um, they, they began leasing their facilities for independent projects. So if you were an independent filmmaker, you could lease studio space to make your movie. And they began a new kind of business plan where they were focusing on, on co-financing and distributing movies. So independent uh, filmmakers would come in and say, hey, listen, I want to make this, but I don't have enough money. And so the studio would throw in some money and then agree to distribute the film, right? So while all this was happening, uh, some of the top talent in Hollywood, the, st the top stars and, and top directors, along with many of the sort of the super agents and, and attorneys, gained a lot of control over production. This was the time period where we saw uh, directors and film stars, for example, starting their own production companies and, and making their own films. And, and this had been sort of unheard of during the uh, studio era. And, and so this is a, a sort of a, a kind of a big change, right, in, in how Hollywood was operating. But we also see that the economy begin to slump in 1947, right? 
Uh, and at the same time, attendance started to go down. So 46 was a banner year. Things were better than they'd ever have been. But 1947 marks a, a change, right, where we see attendance, uh, movie theater attendance dipping in the, the United States, uh, as well as in some of the new international markets. Then, of course, TV hits in the early 1950s. By the mid-1950s, there are TVs in almost every American home. And so, again, the the movie producers, the studios, had to figure out how to deal with this. And one response was to go big, right? Because they wanted to emphasize the difference between the experience of going to the theater and watching TV at home. Now, TV at home in the late 40s, early 50s was small, you know, maybe a 13-inch screen. Uh, it was always in black and white. There was no such thing as color TV. Uh, and there were three stations, right? Uh, and so it really wasn't, I mean, it was really kind of a small viewing experience, to put it in, in plain terms, right? So as a response, the movies went big, right? They wanted to emphasize what movies could do, because you go to the movies and it's this big screen. Screens were much bigger back then than they are now. So it's a really big screen. And so they focus on things like historical spectacles, westerns, biblical epics. Uh, and, and these are not only designed for the domestic United States market, but also for the international market. So these are big, gorgeous-looking Technicolor films where you go in and you watch this thing and you're supposed to be blown away. It, you know, it's sort of the same idea behind the blockbuster, right? Where you go uh, and you watch the latest Jurassic Park and you're wowed by the, by the special effects and dinosaurs. This was the same kind of idea, but back in the, in the late 40s and early 50s. And, of course, moviegoers liked this. The efforts paid off, Right? Uh, the, people went to go see these, these movies that were all about spectacle and, and you know, just being really big and opulent. Uh, and at the same time, then, they were able to, the studios were able to take their old films as well as the new films they were making and get syndication of these films on TV. So that meant that the TV stations would pay them to show their movies because TV needed content, right? Uh, at the same time, TV production begins big time in Hollywood. And, and so the, the studios aren't dumb, and the studios lease space to the folks who are making TV, and then get into the TV game themselves. So at, at the same time, we see, again, changes in movie-going trends, right? Uh, and this keeps going all through the 1950s and all through the 1960s, right? Um, the youth market, again, the baby boomers, become much more important because for the first time in the history of the country, there are more young people than there are middle-aged or older people. And so they become a very important demographic. So it's the biggest part of the population, and they want to appeal to these viewers to get them into the movie theaters. Art cinemas become increasingly popular in the United States. Uh, many of these art cinemas show foreign films. So this is during the time where we see uh, the French New Wave, and Italian neorealist films making, uh, making way into the United States, into these art theaters uh, and art cinemas. And, and uh, it attracts a new kind of uh, cultured, upper class kind of uh, demographic, right? Uh, and then, while Hollywood's making these, these big movies and, and had some initial success, they also begin to have some failures. And when they have these failures, the failures are really big. So what you have are, are films like Cleopatra uh, with Elizabeth Taylor, which cost a ton of money to make, uh, you know, probably the equivalent of several hundred million today, uh, and then goes on to lose money at the box office. So there's this, you know, there's this idea that the films need to be bigger, but as you make the films bigger, the risk gets bigger as well. Because when they fail, they fail really hard. So there's this movement to making these new kinds of movies, but there's, they, this also gives rise to a new kind of innovation, right? Uh, this is the time period of uh, the Hollywood Renaissance. This is the time period where we see filmmakers like Martin Scorsese, uh, Robert Altman, Francis Ford Coppola, all come to the fore making uh, smaller kinds of films, usually. Uh, 
and, and these films uh, gaining an audience with some of these young people. So Hollywood at the time exists in this weird kind of uh, dualism, where on one hand they're making these these big blockbuster style pictures, uh, but they're also making these small, really cheap kind of Hollywood Renaissance uh, art cinema inflected kind of movies, right? So Hollywood's, again, going through this period of instability. They're not sure where to focus. And, and you know, the box office keeps getting worse until about 1972 with the release of The Godfather, which was uh, Francis Ford Coppola's big mob picture, right? And this becomes, uh, this gangster movie becomes a massive hit, both domestically and abroad. So this gives Hollywood an idea for, for kind of a, a new model of blockbuster filmmaking. The, you know, the whole time they've been making these bigger and bigger pictures, they've been trying to refine how to do it, to come up with a really good money-making formula that they could use again and again. And so this finally happens, according to Schatz, uh, with the release of Jaws. So this is uh, the, one of Steven Spielberg's early films. Uh, you, you probably have seen it, right? Uh, and it it was such a hit, right? And it did so many things differently in terms of its marketing and its release and its model for filmmaking that it sort of gave everyone a new idea of, of the kinds of profits that, that Hollywood could make and, and uh, sort of redefined the status of the film as a marketable commodity as well as a cultural phenomenon. You can make movies... That, that became uh, the center of cultural conversation, which Jaws was when it came out. So some of the characteristics that Schatz talks about with Jaws, and, and you'll see here some similarities with the uh, or, you know, ways in which we can compare this to A Duel in the Sun or, or Gone with the Wind. So when, when Jaws was made, it was based on a novel by Peter Benchley, which was a best-selling novel. And indeed, the, the movie rights were purchased even before the novel was published, right? And so what happened was because, you know, Benchley was already a best-selling author, so they went to, the studio went to him and said, listen, we want to buy the rights to your next book, right? So they buy the rights to, to Jaws for a bunch of money, and this is before the book even comes out. So what happens then is the press writes a whole bunch of stories about, oh, the studio spent all this money to buy this, buy the rights to this book, and the book isn't even out yet. And the public reads this, and this begins a kind of anticipation of the film, and it's great marketing, right? So the film itself was uh, packaged, that should be packaged, sorry, uh, by International Creative Management, or ICM, which was sort of the, the big talent agency in Hollywood back in the day. Uh, and they represented Peter Benchley, right? They handled the sale of the movie rights. Uh, and they represented the producing team as well, right? So, so what you have here is the agents are a key element in the making of the blockbuster, right? They put together what's called a package deal. So they have the author as one of their clients. They have uh, Zanuck and Brown as uh, the producers as, as their clients. And they bring all these folks together under their umbrella and orchestrate this deal for this, you know, movie that turns out to be massive. So it was an expensive production, right? About three and a half million dollars to make, which was a bunch of money back, back in the 1970s, and and they spent about 2.5 million in marketing. So this also begins a new trend. Uh, today, it's very common for a major motion picture release for its budget, uh, for the actual production, to be less than the marketing budget, right? Typically, we spend at least as much money today on a big Hollywood blockbuster advertising it as we do making it. And Jaws helped establish this, right? Because this was one of the first times that we saw a studio spending almost as much on marketing a film as they did on making it. And it also had a really big opening. So it, it rolled out simultaneously to 464 theaters, and this, again, was relatively uncommon. Usually they'd open a film in one market, see how it did, and then think about, you know, moving on to other markets. But with Jaws, what you had was this nationwide release. And 464 screens is, is definitely not a lot today, but when Jaws came out, it was. So the result was Jaws sells 25 million tickets in the first 38 days. It does $102 million in, in box office rentals. Now, uh, 
when this says rentals, but it doesn't mean rentals like uh, you know renting it on Amazon Prime. Rentals are are how theaters pay for movies. So it does, uh, you know, the theaters pay the the studio one hundred five, one hundred two point five million dollars. So and this is this is a box office record at the time. There are all kinds of tie-ins, uh, movie merchandising, right? They, they did what was called saturation booking, which means that they released it again in all those theaters all at the same time all across the country. And they also did what was called saturation advertising. And saturation advertising is when you advertise in you know every possible medium uh, to get your word out about your motion picture. We still see this sometimes, right? So examples of saturation advertising when a new Marvel movie comes out, right? There are TV ads, there are radio ads, there's a ton of internet advertisements, there are trailers being released on YouTube, right? There's there's interviews with the stars on every major newscast, uh, there are podcasts about the film, right? That's saturation advertising. So what that means is they just saturate the advertising marketplace with ads for the film. This is all part of that big $2.5 million uh, marketing budget. Then another weird thing that they did with Jaws that studios had shied away from previously was that they released the film during the summer. Now, this probably seems like common sense to us today that people would want to go to the movies in the summer, particularly young people because they're not at school. But prior to Jaws, the studios had tried to avoid releasing films during vacation times. So that the idea was that people wouldn't go to the movies because they're doing like summer vacation, right? Um, they, they wouldn't release films over Christmas. They wouldn't release films during the summer. And Jaws changes, changes all that because it comes out in the summer and it proves to be a huge, huge hit. Now, it's also really commercial in terms of its appeal. It's not as uh, cerebral as many of the uh, traditional... Uh, Hollywood Renaissance films, you know, movies like, um, oh, I don't know, movies like uh, The Graduate or uh, Bonnie and Clyde or something like that, right? It's, it's, it's more commercial in some sense. And it helps to cement the popular popularity of the new multiplex theaters that are opening in suburbs and uh, next to malls and in malls all across the country. So, so it has an enormous economic impact. It also showed us how influential TV advertising was. Now, there's another movie called Billy Jack that, that also helped to show us how, how important TV advertising was for selling movies. Um, Billy Jack is a fun movie, not a masterpiece, but a fun movie that, that made a lot of money because of TV advertising. Now, at the same time, this is when HBO appears on the scene. You know, and HBO, of course, is cable TV, and it gives the studios another outlet to make money off the films they're making. So now they're, they're, they're making money by, by showing movies in theaters, by selling their movies to, to regular broadcast TV stations, and now they can sell the rights to cable as well. And then the next big thing that helped Hollywood was the uh, emergence of the VCR, right, the, the video cassette recorder. And so... This begins with Betamax, which was sort of the, the precursor to VHS. But this starts the home video boom. And all over America, uh, home video stores pop up where you can go rent movies. And, and this became the model then for uh, blockbuster video, right? And, and that whole thing. So all of this, the success of Jaws and the success of the blockbuster, bring about changes, right? Uh, and they bring about changes not just in the way the movies are, are marketed uh, and when they're released and, and how we acquire rights to them and so on, but they also brought changes to the actual movies themselves. So the, the films become increasingly plot-driven with less emphasis on characters. There's not as much character development in these new films. They're really visceral, kinetic, and fast-paced, so they move really quick. And, of course, you y'all are used to this now. Um, if you watch a movie like Jaws today, it would probably seem kind of slow to you. But at the time, it was very fast-paced. Uh, and, and this continues kind of this fast-paced filmmaking, what David Bordwell calls intensified continuity, carries on uh, even to this day, 
where you have these films that move so quickly with so many explosions that it's, it's almost hard to keep up. Right? Uh, Schatz also notes that there's a tendency towards pastiche and the mashup of genres. So, uh, you know, what he's talking about here are, uh, y you know, movies combining uh, different genres. There was a movie about 20 years ago called uh, Aliens, uh, what is it, Aliens and Cowboys or Cowboys and Aliens. I mean, that's an example of this kind of, of, of mashup, right? Uh, and all this can be seen, of course, in the success of Star Wars. Right, which sort of confirmed the success of the blockbuster uh, that was established by Jaws. And in, in Star Wars, of course, what we see is a kind of mashup, right, where you take the old-timey kind of movie uh, serial uh, and combine it with science fiction and, and put the whole thing in outer space. And, and Star Wars is really a very old-fashioned kind of movie serial story, but told in this what was at the time a very cutting edge kind of special effects laden uh, milieu, right? Uh, Indiana Jones goes on to establish Lucas and Spielberg as the box office kings of the 70s and 80s. And of course, these guys uh, make their fortunes making these new kinds of blockbuster films, Spielberg in particular. So, moving into the 80s, by 86, box office revenues uh, comprised barely one quarter of the, of the majors, major studios total, with, with pay cable and home video combining for over half, right? And home video rentals exceeded the box office for the first time that year. So what this means is the way that we watch movies in the United States is changing, right? People are watching more movies at home. They're watching them on cable. And they're watching them on their VCRs, going to their video stores and renting them and then watching them on their VCRs. And this is the first time where these home video re revenues exceeded the ticket sales at the box office. We also see the foreign box office becoming increasingly important. This is all part of the globalization of the Hollywood business model, right? The Hollywood begins to recognize that these big blockbuster movies play really well all across the planet, right? So Star Wars plays well in the United States, but guess what? It plays well in Europe, and it plays well in Asia. And, and so they realize that they can market these movies in these, in these other places and make a ton of money. Now, of course, because we're making bigger, flashier films, production and marketing costs go up. But some of this is offset by a movie tie-ins and what Schatz calls extra textual components. And these are things like your, you know, your Star Wars action figures, your lunch boxes, your, your t-shirts, your Happy Meals, right? All these different places where Hollywood is able to make money off of sort of the, the material that surrounds the film but isn't actually part of the film, right? Again, like your lunch boxes, your Iron Man, uh, you know, Halloween costume, um, you know, your, your Iron Man watch or, or pencil case or, you know, whatever, that, that they can sell the, the marketing rights to these people and make money off these things. So as a result, the economics change, right? So now every one of these big movie projects becomes kind of a multimedia production line. So sure, you make the movie, right? But then you also have to make the video game, you have to make the, the novels that expand on the story, you have to make the comic books, you have to make, now you have to make the TV show, right? Um, you know, there's this whole, it becomes like a whole uh, cross-medium kind of uh, enterprise, right? Where you're not just making money at the movies, you're making money with it everywhere you can. And in some sense, the films become kind of advertisements for the product lines, right? So, the, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure that the Avengers films make tons of money at the box office. I, I know that most of them, if not all of them, grossed over a billion dollars. But at the same time, you can also look at those actual movies as kind of advertisements, again, for the toys, for the Halloween costumes, for the lunch boxes, for the, you know, branded Gatorade, right? And all these other things that surround it, right? Uh, Hollywood begins to put more emphasis on what we call high concept films. And these are films that can be, where the plot can be described in 25 words or less. So really simple plots, but with a lot of spectacle on the screen, a lot of explosions and beautiful people and, and special effects. So what, what's happening 
then is, is sort of a contradiction. You have this kind of massive world-building effort that we see around films like Star Wars, where the Star Wars universe is so big, right, and has its own history and its own kind of characters and groups and, and stories, right? But the, the actual stories that the films themselves are telling are pretty simple, right? They have simplistic plots. So it's this weird kind of contradiction that's going on that's still enormously profitable, right? There's a strong emphasis on the traditional three-act structure of the film. And again, an emphasis on the intertextual qualities, meaning um, the, the ability to tell the story outside of just the film, right? So there, with Star Wars, there are Star Wars novels and Star Wars comic books and Star Wars TV shows. And each one of these is a different text, but they're all related to the film. And so they have this intertextual relationship, right, where the story is continued in other, other kinds of mediums. Okay, so that gets us through shots. And, and, you know, the reason that I assign this piece, I realize it's a little dry, but the reason that I assign this shots piece is because I think it gives us a, a really nice way of, of looking at how Hollywood films are made today, particularly the superhero comic book kind of films. And it gives us kind of an understanding from a financial perspective why these things work the way they do, why they're released at the times that they're released, right, which is usually over, you know, Christmas holidays or uh, during the summer, uh, why so much money is spent on advertising, uh, why we can always expect all these different products to surround the film, uh, why we can expect the stories to be continued on cable TV uh, in, in sort of uh, series like... Uh, Oh, I don't know, what's the Mandalorian, right, and, and so on. And it gives us a, a way of thinking about where we're at today in terms of big Hollywood uh, productions. And, and I think it gives us some insight into uh, how popular culture is made today. Okay, well, thanks for checking out the lecture, and I will follow up shortly with another one.